This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 985, recorded on February 16th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent, and hello there, Rich. Um, <clears throat> looking out my window here, it looks it looks okay, but it's not, and it's supposed to rain later today. But yesterday was a ridiculous day. The temperature went up to 67 degrees in Fort Lee, New Jersey. This should not be happening in February, and yet it is. I think it's climate alterations, Dixon. Uh, <clears throat> if I didn't think so, I wouldn't have told you. <laughs> also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there. Uh, it is uh, 50 degrees oh. and cloudy, overcast, socked in. Uh, and it's going to probably, it's going to come close to freezing tonight. It's going to be this way for the next couple of days. Then early next week, it's going to be 85. Oh. Welcome to winter in Texas. That's right. Crazy. That's right. Two announcements for you. First of all, registration is open for ASV 2023 meeting. It's going to be in Athens, Georgia, June 24th through the 28th. ASV.org slash ASV2023 for information. Remember, members can apply for support for dependent care during the meeting, ASV Cares, or can sign up on the meeting site for on-site child care through Kitty Corp, asv.org slash asv2023 slash child care. TWIV 1000 is a happening thing. April 15th, 6 p.m. here in New York City at the Helen Mills Theater. which is booked today. I sent them a deposit. The theater holds 130 people. I'm guessing we're not going to fill it. You Prove are? me wrong. Oh, Vincent, <laughs> I think you're way off. You'd be over so If you would like to go, if you'd like to go, send an email to vincent at microbe.tv, subject line, TWIV1000. And, you know, the first 130 people uh, will let in. We would love if you could make an optional donation. You know, you go to the museum, the Metropolitan Museum here in New York. They say, our suggested donation, I don't know, 25 bucks, Dixon? I haven't been there in a while. Uh, uh, Up from that, I think it's a little bit higher now. Anyway, we suggest you make a $100 donation per ticket because it's quite costly to do this, and the whole crew will be there. Me, Dixon, Alan Dove, Rich Condit, Kathy Spindler, Brianne Barker, Angela Mingarelli, and, of course, Daniel Griffin. That's eight people. And Tell him what else. Tell him all. what else. And Dixon's nephew, who has a saxophone. He has a saxophone. <laughs> what do you call the trio? He's, he's a quartet, by the way. It's the Randall de Pommier Quartet. The Randall de Pommier Quartet will play before and after. And what are the other instruments besides Randall's uh, piano, saxophone? Piano, bass, and drums. Piano, bass, and drums. Yep. Bass is the upright thing. Boom, 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 That's boom, the one. Boom, right. Right. It's so like oh. uh, the same composition as Rubeck, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I also want to thank Lise, who has donated $300 for some three students who would like to attend. You probably should be in New York City because if you can't afford the 100 bucks, you're not going to afford to get here, right? But she will pay for three of you to attend, three times 100. So if you're a student here in New York or close by and you could afford to come in, New Jersey, Westchester, you know, Long Island, you take the train. That's a very Double generous buck. offer. That's that's yes. Nice. Thank you, Liz, for that donation of uh, three tickets. Should be a blast and a lot of fun, also. By the way, backing up just a bit, I think that the fact that this is not new, but the fact that ASV offers child care is just awesome. That's great. I would agree. You can bring your kids, if both if both spouse, if both partners are virologists, you can both come and bring your kids. What the heck? Right. All right, or if one, if you're an only per, if you're an only parent, you right, you bring your kid, makes it easier. Got it right. Many different permutations. A couple of things for you today. We have some news. 
Equatorial Guinea confirms its first ever Marburg virus disease outbreak. Mm. The Equatorial Guinea is on the west coast of Africa. It's, a, it's over by the bump, right before Africa it's, curves is it, is under. It the, is it on the equator? Sorry, west coast. <laughs> Did I say east, west coast? You know, it's, I have yeah, to, it's in West Africa. West Africa, but kind of north where the bump comes out. Right. And um, so Marburg virus disease, 16 suspected cases as of the 13th of February. It's, I bet there's a more update. Uh, but that, and nine deaths, fever, wow. fatigue, blood, stained vomit, and diarrhea. That's a hemorrhagic now, fever, right? The thing about uh, Marburg virus, of course, Marburg was virus was first discovered in primate facilities in Marburg and Frankfurt, Germany, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, which is now, of course, Serbia. There were simultaneous outbreaks of hemorrhagic fever in primate facilities from monkeys that were, or non-human primates that were brought from Africa to those laboratories. Right. Am I correct in assuming that those monkeys came from the same source? They might have. In Ugandan Cause, imported cause African green monkeys. Must yeah. be. Yeah. So, and now the reservoir is the African fruit bat, Rosettus aegyptiacus. And they, they have isolated infectious Marburg virus from those bats. So it's very clear uh, that those are the reservoir. And I was looking at the range of this bat. And it, it's kind of near Guinea, but it doesn't overlap. So maybe the, the range map I was looking at was wrong. But the, the bat is found throughout Africa, that's for sure. And by the way, so, this is a, the, the virus is a phylovirus. Uh, closely, well, I don't know how closely, but it's a relative. It's in the same family as Ebola. Okay. I was in and Marburg, the, and the disease a has a similar presentation. So, right. I was invited and, uh, by Herxt to uh, to give a lecture and to also uh, see whether or not the vex the uh, immunological test that I had developed would have uh, been commercially uh, successful or not. And of course, the the answer came back, not commercially successful, but it's a wonderful test. Thank you very much. While I was there, though, I got the story about the outbreak of Marlboro virus at the uh, facility. And I was there like uh, five or six months after that had happened. And uh, it was kind of scary because I think some people actually at uh, Herx died from this, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah. There were 31 yeah, yeah. cases uh, reported in among the two... Uh, outbreaks and seven people died. Right. All right. So I'm looking at a map of previous cases. So we have we have uh, Marburg, Frankfurt, Belgrade. Then there was a previous outbreak in Guinea in 2021, Ghana 22, Angola, DRC, Uganda, Kenya, and even Johannesburg. Interesting. 1975. So there have been previous outbreaks. Most so of these are pretty small. There's a good there's a good table at CDC. Most of these are pretty small, but the uh, 1998 2000 outbreak in DRC uh, was 154 cases with an 83 percent case fatality rate. Wow! And in Angola 2004 2005 is 252 cases with a 90 percent case fatality rate. Why Many of the other outbreaks out? are relatively small. Excuse me, Dixon? I say, why does this infection burn out? Why doesn't it keep uh, spreading? I have the same question. Uh, I, I don't know because they describe it as, okay, so it spills over from bats into humans. Humans can transmit it uh, from human to human by uh, direct contact, contact or right. contact with bodily fluids and stuff. So, uh, you know, re fundamentally the same uh, it's Ebola, as right? uh, Ebola. Ebola, yeah. Yeah. exactly right. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that... Um, uh, you know, maybe it is not as transmissible as Ebola. Though, you know, until the outbreak, God, when was that huge Ebola? Uh, 2015. Outbreak? 2015. They were, well, you know, they, they they had outbreaks that were in the hundreds of cases, yeah. but not yes. the thousands. That's true. Um, so maybe it's not as transmissible. Maybe, I don't know. Do you have I any mean, ideas? I mean, these are... These are Typically transmitted, as you said, by close contact with body fluid. So if a family's taking care of a body yeah. to bury it, which is typical contact with the body. Or in a hospital, if you're not aware of yeah. infection control, that's right. that's you right. know, you're taking care of patients, you're going to get infected. So 
that can be all controlled. You can implement infection control. You can tell people what to do. And eventually you bring these to an end because it is not really very good at going. It doesn't do respiratory droplets, for example, no. from person to person. It just doesn't do it for whatever reason. If you intubate someone and they spray fluid at your face, yeah, you could get <laughs> infected. But, right, right. you know, those are big droplets of water. Well, I think one fluid. of the, uh, in the big <laughs> Ebola outbreak, um, I think one of the things that contributed to that was that it, the uh, the uh, initial and maybe a couple of the subsequent outbreaks were in densely populated urban c centers. It it got a foothold there, which I think was right. was right. somewhat unusual, and that contributed to the size. And of the also, outbreak. they didn't. It had never been in in uh, Western Africa before, so. They, they thought it was malaria or something else. It took three months for them to get an Ebola diagnosis, by which time it was really established. And right. Yeah, and one of the comments on this is that there's praise from whoever this wrote this article uh, for of the uh, government for identifying this quickly yeah, and yeah. Uh, getting on top of it. I heard a great story this morning, by the way, uh, on NPR of all places, as to why the price of eggs has gone down. Now, <laughs> I knew I knew Not why up. it went up, but why did it go back down? And the answer was that some egg-producing um, facilities had very strict barrier regulations as to who can come and who can go inside the farm. And they had no H5N1 outbreak, none, zero. And everybody around them was suffering from the ravages of the influenza virus that that killed all the hens. And this company restocked everybody else's uh, local hen house, basically, with the surplus of egg layers that they had. And they still had enough to make sure that the price of eggs didn't go right through the ceiling. So and then of course they said the reason why it's going down is because we're, the holiday season is over with and nobody's buying a lot of eggs anymore. But the real reason was that they practiced good barrier control, and that's the I'm, whole secret to all of this. Aren't you surprised that they didn't take advantage of the market and charge more? This guy sounded absolutely a straight shooter. He was um, very very concerned about consumer um, attitudes. And the price of eggs, because eggs has been eggs have been very stable for the last, you know, fifteen or twenty years, basically. And uh, it's and it's he says it's one of the cheapest, uh, high protein sources of food, and it's mm. a perfect. It's actually a perfect food. Of course, it is for the chicken. But uh, he had a lot of good things to say about it. He was not a a, a privateer or a. a a ravager of the economic market, basically. He Dixon. was a good, a good guy. I bought a baguette yesterday in the supermarket. <laughs> yes. 12 bucks. Ooh. How much? You know, just the thing. It's a couple of inches. It's like a couple yeah. feet long. And Go on. A few inches. Yeah, and it should be four or five bucks. 12 bucks. Get. You saw I've been at the wrong store. <laughs> I got another market for you to go to. <laughs> no, it's it's never been that high. I've bought it there before. And it's, you think it's because of the eggs? Well, they do put eggs in bread, right? Yeah, sure. I would guess. So they're taking advantage of the situation. I don't know. Anyway, I don't eat that much of it, so it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> So we'll we'll keep an eye on that. I'm I'm thinking they're going to contain it, and it's not going to go very yeah, right, far. Right, right, right. Yeah, it sounds right. like they're on top of it. So how many times have we said that before? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Did we say that in the beginning. No, you're quite right. Uh, I said it in the beginning. I said it in the beginning of SARS. I think I said it in the beginning of the Ebola outbreak and the measles. You know? Remember the measles outbreak. So I'm not going to say it this time. All please, right. Please don't. You can say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. We have a snippet for you, which was sent to us by Nancy, who is a biosafety specialist at the University of Minnesota. Wow. And this is a rapid communication in Eurosurveillance. That's the journal. Wild poliovirus type 3 shedding event following detection in environmental surveillance of poliovirus essential facilities, the Netherlands, November 2022 to January 2023. The whole story is in that is in the title. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Erwin <laughs> Dweezer is the first author. Margrit Margrit Tewirik is the last author. This comes from 
National Institute for Public Health and the Environment in the Netherlands, the Public Health Service Region in the Netherlands, and the National Authority for Containment in the Netherlands. Vincent, is Yoko van de Giesen one of the authors? You remember <laughs> no. her? No, really, she works there, and she she's worked on bird flu before. I haven't met her. I wouldn't remember. No, would it, I, I know you've paper. mentioned her name many times. It's not in the paper itself? No, no, she's not on the paper. Okay. All right, so uh, as we approach eradication, or uh, maybe we're never going to eradicate for reasons I said uh, a few episodes ago, but type types two and three, wild poliovirus types two and three have been declared eradicated. And so if you want to work with them, you have to become a poliovirus essential facility, a PEF, and then you have to apply. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you're going to make the vaccine, so the inactivated vaccine uses wild type polio viruses. Uh, so you have to have a polio essential facility. You want to make diagnostics or, or something using the wild polio strains. You have to apply. And, and your government typically has a, a NAC, a National Authority for Containment of Polio Virus. You apply to them. You say, I want to be a polio essential facility. And they tell you what you have to do. You have to be very strict about it. So... Um, <laughs> which yes. uh, I, I can never keep this straight. Which serotypes have been eliminated? Wild types two and three. So, do you know what they immunize with now in the Netherlands? Inactivated. The, inactivated, which uses wild types one, two, and three, right? Okay, so it's trivalent. Is trivalent. So yeah, they still need to grow type three. Yeah, they need and, to grow type okay. three, and that's that's why the vaccine production plant is a polio essential facility. So right? this, sounded, as I was reading this, it sounded like this is a vaccine uh, uh, manufacturer. Is that is that correct? I could. Biltoven is the really center tell. of the yeah, Euro. Yeah, that's the. Um, National well, Institutes I, of Health in Biltoven. I, I don't know if it's a manufacturer. Or it could be they're making diagnostics or. It, one of those things would qualify you to be a, a polio essential. Let me look right. it up here. They say there, um, there are other big product is facilities BCG. for vaccine production, polio diagnostics, and surveillance. So it could be that this is a surveillance place. I don't really know, and they don't say it. Right. Okay. So it could be one of those three things. Uh, but what they do, they have to have a protocol in place for surveillance, routine surveillance. What they do is they collect wastewater right. from buildings. Used, so used for vaccine production, polio diagnostic labs, and toilet groups. I don't know what a toilet group is, but <laughs> so these facilities, because polio is excreted in the feces, they have to screen the feces from the toilets that people are using to make sure that people aren't uh, shedding. And they look for infectious polio virus. And recall that if you have been <laughs> immunized with inactivated virus, as have these individuals, you can still grow virus. You don't get sick with it, but it can uh, yep, infect right. and grow in your intestines and be shed in the feces. So they take these these toilet, these waste wastewater samples from the buildings, and, and they do this at a regular basis. They look for virus in cells and culture. And they say any infectious virus detection is a breach of containment, and you have to investigate it. Right. They say, and this is also very interesting. They say the release and detection of inactivated viruses and incomplete genome fragments by PCR does not necessarily indicate infectious virus, therefore is not regulated. Mm. So you, they don't care if you're PCR positive. They want to see infectious virus. They don't care so if this your paper, sewage is PCR positive. PCR positive, yes. So the they sewage, do plaques. They, they do plaque assay, right? Well, they, yeah. they use – they put the, <laughs> the, the stool, they filter it, and they put it on a cell line called L20B. Ah which was made in my laboratory many years ago. Really? It's a mouse L cell where we put the gene for the human polio receptor in. What's an L cell? So, an intestinal cell? No, a mouse L cell. It's a fibroblast cell line. It's a famous mouse cell line. So okay. Rich probably knows okay. of L cells, okay. right? Sure. Uh, uh, I think that they were originally cultured from, from you know, you have to immortalize cells yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. To, to culture them. And I think that this was some sort of uh, chemical treatment, mutagenic right. treatment that ultimately yeah. made them culturable. I could be not wrong. A but hybridoma, I not a hybridoma. So, so we took L cells. We put the, we had cloned the gene for the polio receptor. We put it into L cells and we had L20B cells, we called them. 
and then they're used because only polio will grow in them. No other enterovirus will grow in these. It's a great screening uh, tool for polio, and many labs around the world use it. I'm very proud that we are contributing to something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Come on, that's All right, so during 2022, uh, samples of sewage were collected every three weeks. 74 were analyzed. Uh, 50 from three sampling sites at the Utrecht Science Park in Biltoven. Um, all, all were negative for infectious virus except one. The one positive sample, one sample positive for infectious polio collected in November 15th. They isolated virus from it in cell culture in L20 B cells. They did genome sequencing. It turned out to be wild polio 3 Sauquet strain, which is the strain used to make an activated polio vaccine. Mm. It had two or they had two isolates, and they have two or three mutations compared with the vaccine stock that is used, which they think means it went through a person. Because if it's directly released from the vaccine production facility, you shouldn't have any mutations, right? And then follow up samples on December 6th and January 10th negative. Okay, so what happens when you're in a polio essential facility? You get some infectious wild polio. Well. There are guidelines <laughs> you have to investigate. Indeed. You have to see what's going on. And so because they found these mutations in the isolate, they said it's probably human shedding. So they went and they asked everyone for two stool samples and one serum sample from every employee who had access to, to wild polio 3 strains, which you can know from your records, right? So that was 51 people uh, did RT-PCR. Uh, and they found one uh, employee with a serological response to recent infection. They have antibodies to polio. Hmm. And two stool samples from that person were positive for uh, polio 3. Wild, wild polio 3. All the other stool samples from the other 50 employees were negative. So they found one person who pooped out polio, saw cat type 3. All right? And... Uh, that, well, so what do you do with this person? <laughs> that, this person, and I, this is crazy. They agreed to a voluntary isolation. They put him so they couldn't stay home because the person lived in an area with below 90% vaccination coverage. So they said that this person could be shedding polio and infect the neighborhood. That's not good. So they put the person, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, in a residence provided by the, by the facility, the PEF, where you could isolate people and it's in an area where you have more than 90% vaccination coverage. All the stools were collected and burned and a little was saved for, for screening and they monitor for polio virus. So this person was put in there before the end of December and the person was released 33 days later Wow. January 11th, after three consecutive negative stool samples. And so this person was in this home by itself. I guess watching a lot of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Writing is... Through Christmas and New Year's. And they even provided psychological support because they said, you know, if you're alone in a house, you need psychological support. So this was voluntary. The, the person did it. They, they asked him, would you do this? You know, I, I'm not sure... I don't know. I don't know about this, but I mean, if people are vaccinated, this this person is not a, a threat. But obviously, not enough people are vaccinated. Um, so um, they took throat swabs of this person before they put them in the facility, and and there's no no polio in the throat. So they said the only threat for transmission is poop. So um, they they put this person in and burned all the poop that came out, and and the the virus was excreted. 51 days total from 15th November, that was the first positive to January 5th. And they say, we don't know why it's so long. But in fact, some people do shed for a long period of time. That's already been known. Uh, and so the, the, the patient had the same, had one polymorphism that was identical to the original um, wastewater sample. So they said, this is the source of the positive from the laboratory. And then they said, all right, who have you been in contact with? So they've, they identified all the contacts, 27 contacts of this person. All their stool samples were negative, so nobody was right. infected. 
They don't say what this person did to that, get that, infected. I was going to ask that right away, of course. And I think that's important to you prevent it from happening again. <laughs> that's right. Well, they may, uh, yeah, they may know or they may have an idea or maybe they, maybe they don't. But they probably don't know. You would think that in a situation like this, uh, if they knew, they would uh, – publish that as well because you know that's part of the caution don't yeah do but this. they might identify him as a result yeah so they don't uh, identify them. them we don't even know what the, we don't know the sex the we don't know the sex and they do that because i'm sure they might i meant them i do i did yeah I, I, but, I know you know to work with with this virus i'm sure you do it in a hood and you have to wear gloves and all this and maybe the, the person did a little breach. Maybe they picked Excellent. up a vial without gloves one day, and that was exactly all it took, right. right? Exactly right. But you can't. You have to follow the procedure to the T every minute. Otherwise, oh. this could happen, right? Old employee, new employee. That's another no thing. No idea. I don't, don't know. Anyway, this is the kind of surveillance you need around a PEF, a polio essential facility. And, and multiple, many countries do want to have PEFs. So they can continue to make a vaccine or make diagnostics or um, yep. surveillance. So the kind of surveillance we were talking about a few weeks ago, wastewater surveillance, you could argue that you may need to be a PEF for that, but you know, because you're going to have virus in this in the wastewater unless you inactivate it. So. so the bad news is that there was a breach. The good news is that they uh, so they figured it out, yeah, and there were no downstream consequences. <laughs> So their yeah. system works. Yeah. Their system works. It is the Netherlands where everything works, right? <laughs> well, you'd think so, but they uh, <laughs> the they really won't good. all agree with that. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, so you have to the, – the guidelines are published by WHO, and every country has to implement them in a proper fashion. You have to have your national authority for containment. Uh, so you have to follow the guidelines. I think um, – you know, we could eradicate all three wild polio viruses, but there's still vaccine-derived polio viruses circulating, which cause polio if you're not vaccinated. Right. And there's silent transmission, asymptomatic transmission, as we discussed. So I don't know how you're going to eradicate if you have silent transmission. Because uh, you cannot, you know, the smallpox worked because if you got infected, you had smallpox, you had yeah. lesions, you could yeah. tell. But 99% of the people infected with polio have nothing. So you can't you can't sample everyone's poop once a month. No. Uh, you know, it's not dependent on uh, – you just can't go after the paralytic cases. That's the problem. You know, in New York we had the case last summer, and they look in the wastewater, and there's, there's virus in a lot of places and elsewhere in the U.S., as you see. So I think it's a real problem, this eradication idea. I I used to be – very bullish on it, but uh, I have now come to the realization that it may be not going to happen, and we just need to keep vaccinating. But we'll see. I could be wrong. By the way, while we were talking, I looked up L cells, and although I didn't get all the way back to the 1955 publication, I can find <laughs> no evidence uh, for my. Uh, a claim that there was some sort of treatment to get them to grow in culture. So it's quite possible, especially back in 1955, that mm, they just got lucky. Anything, yeah. got so lucky. with mice, you can <clears throat> you can make primary cells from a mouse and continue to passage it. It will go through a crisis, and then what grows are transformed. Yeah, you can do that. You can't do that with human cells. For for uh, I think the telomeres are short on human cells, shorter than mouse telomeres, you know, the ends of the chromosome. So you can't pass human cells enough to get them through that crisis period. You have to mutagenize them to get transformed cells. So this, uh, making cell cultures to culture a polio was the uh, the <clears throat> harbinger of everything else to come, right? Because before that, they didn't know how to grow cells and they didn't have the right media to grow the cells. And so you had Enders and uh, Weller and uh, yeah. some other Robinson. people that collaborated yeah. on this. And you, this was the original L cell. Is that the deal? I mean, is that what no, that L happened? No, these are mouse cells. Enders, Weller, and Robbins used tissues from embryos. But right, they were not embryos. continuous lines then, right? No, no, they were just primary cells. Right. From uh, nobody had so, figured out how. So this is 1949, before HeLa cells were. 
So you, in your laboratory, what year was that when it became the standard for polio growth? Oh, my lab was it was 1982, but the, by then we had HeLa cells and continuous so, cell lines. So why so the big? It, uh, wait a minute. Why the big delay between 1955 for L cells and finally L cells in 1980 something was? No, no. This, this, HeLa cells were made in 1951. Those are human continuous cell lines, and they allowed you to do all the serological studies with the polio vaccine trial, right, to do infectivity neutralization assays that you needed to say the vaccines were inducing neutralizing antibodies. So the, the HeLa cells were essential for that. The virus was not grown in, in those cells. It was grown in monkey kidney cells, primary monkey kidney cells. But throughout the 50s then, we had transformed cell lines, starting with HeLa cells, mouse L cells, and others, and from then right. on, we had all kinds of transformed cells. So the L cell virus became the industrial uh, One cell. Of them. Okay. Depends on the virus. Polio okay. never grew in L cells. There's no receptor in it. Until it 1991, there. we put you the receptor gene that. in L cells, and now we have L20B. Did that make it easier to use those cells then than the HeLa cells prior to that? No, not necessarily. Oh, For I us, it was proving that the receptor was all you needed. No, to, no, I know what you them. proved, but I wondered why you thought it was a breakthrough in terms of, you know. Well, we identified the receptor. It hadn't been identified before. And one of the ways we did it was to take the gene that we thought encoded the receptor and put it into a cell, L cells that did not have the receptor on it. No, I got that part. Why, why did I think it was a breakthrough? For the industry for, to manufacture the virus. Yeah. I didn't think it was a breakthrough for the industry. You, no. you, earlier in the show, you said something about it was a diagnostic advance because... A diagnostic advance. Okay. Oh, that's right. A poop, diagnostic. If you take a screening, poop. A screening. Okay. Take poop okay. from people. Okay. Okay. It's okay. full of enteroviruses. Okay. okay. And they may have polio okay. if they have... I got you. I got you. I got you. Paralytic disease. You want to know if they have polio. No, I'm, I'm okay. okay. You put it on L cells. The only enterovirus that will grow right. is poliovirus. Right. Okay. 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 Because so. none of the others grow because none of the other receptors are on that L cell. So it's a really nice, quick assay. Oh, look. We have cytopathic effect in L20Bs. I'm with you. Then you can go on and sequence it and see if it's right. polio, right? Now, all those plaque so assays. So these L20Bs are all over the world. Very nice. The plaque assays that you have in your office. You don't have an yes. office like that anymore, but what was the cell type <laughs> used in that? <laughs> those are HeLa cells. All of them. Yeah, because you can grow them by the buckets. Oh, but of course. But of course. In spinner cultures, and that's what you need to do 1,600 six-well plates. Yeah. You right. need a big spinner, right. like a liter or two. What was your your cell of choice for vaccinia, Rich? BSC forties. It's a derivative BSC. of BSC. Derivative of BSC ones, uh, an African green monkey kidney cell line. African they were uh, isolated. BSC forties were derived by, I believe, Dan Nathan's, uh, to yeah. do to um, to do uh, work with temperature sensitive mutants of SV forty. So right. the, the forty indicates it, he uh, it. Never says quite how, but I think they were passaged at uh, 40 degrees C for a long period of time to select for cells that would do okay mm. at that temperature, so that that gave you, um, you know, it, it made it so that you could use a higher temperature for uh, looking yeah. for temperature sensitive mutants. So, mm -hmm. but I never, you know, I always carried them at 37, which was probably a mistake, but that's what I did. Okay, so I, in the end. Although they grew the virus really well, uh, and they had a yeah, they had a uh, temperature cutoff that was near forty degrees, but man, it was close. You mm -hmm. really had to you really had to be finicky about your incubator temperatures to get any of this stuff to work. Some of the some of the mutants were temperature sensitive within a half a degree of when the cells would finally die, mm. so it was tricky. All right, we have a paper for you, which which I originally selected. It involves deer, because Angela was going to be on this episode, huh. our our veterinarian. I thought she would like to talk about deer, but uh, she's not here. I really like so, this paper. Uh, well, it's in PNAS. White-tailed deer, Odocoileus virginianus, may serve as a wildlife reservoir for nearly extinct SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern. It's a group out of Cornell University in Ithaca, Leonardo Caserta. Caserta is the name of a city outside of Naples. I know that because my uh, grandmother was from Caserta. 
Matthias Martins, Salman Butt, Nicholas Hollingshead, Lena Kovaleda, Sohel Ahmed, Mia Everts, Kristen Schuler, and Diego Deal. Deer, a lot of deer in New York State. So this was a study to look at how many deer are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and what kind of SARS-CoV-2. Now, uh, we've done papers before showing similar surveys. This is a big one, though. Uh, but what we may not have mentioned is that people have actually done experimental inoculations of deer, uh, white-tailed deer. This is the species here, right? Um, right. Because there are other kinds. Um, and when you experimentally inoculate them in the lab, they, they get nasal shedding and virus replication and deer-to-deer -deer transmission. You don't get terribly sick. All right, so there are th it turns out there are 30 million deer in North America. And I have about 29 million in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, I, I drive in the driveway. It's dark, and we have this big pack of Sandra patch in front of the house. And like a dozen deer sitting there, and they're looking at me. You can see the whites of their eyes glowing in my headlights. They're just looking at me. I get out of the car. I walk in. They don't even budge. <laughs> yeah. They're saying, what are you doing? What are you doing in our pack of sand? That's right. That's right. You know? So funny. They're just <laughs> chewing away, looking at me. No problem. Well, I'm really Is glad okay? you. I'm really glad you provide some space for these deer. Oh, that's, that's fine. Good. I don't have a. I wouldn't chase them away. They're they're cool. They reproduce every year. Sure, All right, so this disease. is <laughs> this is part of a surveillance program in New York State, which is basically har hunter harvested deer. Right. They they allow, you know, like a quarter of a million deer every year to be to be hunted in New York State, because yep. there are a lot of them, and it would be too many if you didn't uh, allow hunting. So I don't know what that means. If you know, it's not. All the deer. It's not a rep. Do you think it's a representative sample looking at the hunter harvested, or probably not? Yeah, no, right? because, uh, no, the, because the no <laughs> the hunters uh, there are are there not restrictions on what they can shoot? There are. I, I don't know, but it seems to me that maybe the deer that get shot are a little sick to begin with. No, I don't no, know. no, 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 no. It's not like that, no? Vincent. No, it is not like that at all. The, Why the, the the hunting season starts with a bow season, and you're allowed to shoot both bucks and uh, does. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, shotgun season for states like New Jersey, because they don't want you to use a rifle uh, because it goes too far. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah sure. So uh, they have a shotgun or it's a, it's a slug. Uh, they have a season. It's a very short season. And I believe it's only the doe, uh, the, the bucks, not the does. And um, that only lasts for about a month and a half or something like this. Uh, so it's not enough of a harvest to replace the predators that we chased out. I understand. That's too bad. Right, Except anyway, the, the cars point... now are. <laughs> yeah, they get some. But the they point are... is that the samples they get from these uh, these deer, these are uh, lymph node samples. Um, they're from wild hunter harvested white-tailed deers during the two hunting seasons, 2020 and 21. Okay. By the way. The other day at, on Facebook, someone pictured, posted it in a local town, a picture of a deer with an arrow through its front leg. Right. It's just walking around. So right. a hunter had missed, and the deer now is walking around. I didn't miss. Probably going to die <laughs> from an infection at some point, right? So, so uh, uh, they piggybacked onto an existing program that is uh, surveying for chronic wasting disease. That's right. right. So the, That's right. So the... Uh, a program was already in place that they could mm -hmm. easily, fairly easily yeah. Yeah. Right, right. get samples from and add their analysis to it. Retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So, you know, in the area of the nasopharynx, which is where you expect to find uh, material draining from the nasopharynx. Okay? And apparently they knew from their laboratory studies that this was a hot yeah. spot for virus replication. So it was a good... Good area to sample. Two seasons, 2020, that's September through December, and 21 is July through December. Uh, they do PCR. They detect RNA in season one, 17 out of 2,700, that's 0.6%. Season two, uh, 583 out of 2,700, which is 20%, so it goes up in season two. Mm -hmm. 
and um, th they took um, the samples that had CT values lower than 30, like 29, 28, 27, that lower, okay, which was 11 from one season one, 205 from season two. They tried to isolate virus on Vero E6 cells with Tempress 2, the surface protease you need for the virus to enter at the surface. And they got infectious virus from seven samples of season two. So there's infectious virus in some of these deer. And they also did in situ hybridization, immunofluorescence, uh, to show that there is virus in the, uh, the lymph node tissue. Actually, I wasn't sure that the, at least the immunofluorescence two. was the tissue. Yeah, I think Vero. that was, that was cultured cells. Yeah, it's Vero cells. And I think, right. uh, I think the, uh, in situ hybridization may be as well, because what they did was it they, is, yeah. they took the, I spent some time with this cause I was curious about it. Uh, this graph they have in figure one D they show what they did was they took samples from mm -hmm. the tissue and stuck them on cultured cells and look for cytopathic effect. Right. And if they saw that is the cells uh, looking sick. And if they saw a cytopathic effect, then they uh, uh, took samples of that and passaged it again, okay, put it back onto cells. And at some point or another, they went back to both of these samples and actually uh, titrated the virus in them by a, a TCID-50, that is doing a serial dilution and putting them on cells and looking for the cytopathic effect. And if you look at this graph, there's a lot of the primary isolations that are below the limit of detection. This is what got my attention. I was going, wait a minute, hmm. how can you... How can you <laughs> rank something as a positive if it's below the limit of detection? Right. Well, probably they saw a cytopathic effect, but it's not. It's it, they couldn't actually quantify it because it was yeah. low, below yeah. the limit of detection. But then they passaged it, and of course, all the passage viruses uh, have uh, fairly high titers. And then I think it's those passage viruses that they put again on cultured cells and look for RNA and uh, both spike yeah. and in protein by appropriate histological techniques and we're able to confirm, yeah, this is SARS-CoV-2. Right. Yep. Not, not tissues. That would have been cool to do tissues. That would have been cool. No, I hard. wouldn't be surprised if they tried, but my yeah, guess right, is right. you don't get a lot of positivity yeah. out of it. Plus, well, yeah. All right. Well, so where are these coming from? The, um, the, the samples were from 57 out of 62 counties in New York. And um, in season one, they had 17 positives in 10 of the 62 counties. I'm not going to name them, but 10. Of, and in season two, they had 48 counties with positives. So a big expansion of the positives from 17 count, 10 counties to 48. Uh, and um, they have a lovely map here yeah. in figure uh, two showing... Uh, the map of New York State, season one, the red, so all the dots are all the samples they tested. We were all over the state, basically. And in season two, you can see a lot of reds, a lot more reds than in season one. Are there any dots on Long Island? There's one in season two, all the way at tip. Because that has got so many deer, they don't know what to do with them. I mean, they... Yeah, there, there were not a lot of samplings on Long Island. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because there's no hunting, two. there is no hunting. On Long what's Island. there's no hunting? What's yeah. the no. northern tip of uh, Long Island? There, the northern that's tip. Where, that's that's how where Plum Island is, right? Uh, a little bit further out, but yeah, that's right. That's the right area. So there's a fork, Dixon, at the end of Long that's right. Island, right? Yep. Which Plum Island is off? Which part of the fork? The upper. I believe or the it's lower? off the upper one. I think so, yeah. Hmm. But I don't know which what that fork is called. Uh, I used to know. I thought it was Orient Point. Yeah, well, that's one of them. I'll find the others, out. Um, I think it's Orient there, there Point. There are just so many deer out there. Yeah, the Orient Point is the is southern. the northern four. That's the northern one? southern? I thought northern was... Hmm. Plum Island is off of Orient Point, yeah. It's the northern fork. Northern portion, yeah. yeah. The, the southern fork the... is Montauk. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Silly. Yeah. Exactly right. And Gardner's Island yep. is right in between. Cool. Um, 
All right, so it it expanded there. Very good. Um, they did a kind of analysis to see where the hotspots of deer infections. It's called a spatial cluster analysis, and they they find some hotspots. It's interesting. Um, they have another map showing these hotspots where there are particularly high number of infected deer. One of them is uh, Orange County, pretty close, right next to Rockland County, which is where that polio case was last year, so very close to New York City. Of course, they didn't sample any deer in New York City. Uh, there's no hunting in New York City. Dixon, are there deer in New York City? Not with it. Well, yes. In Central I mean, Park? Y- yes. No, 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 no. There's no deer in Central Park, none. But if you go out. Are you out, sure? Hmm? Are you sure? Uh, I think I'm sure. I, I think everybody else is sure. But the Bronx Zoo has deer, right? They have um, coyotes in Central Park, but they don't have, and, and they chase them back to where they came from. All right. Um, but I think within the city limits of New York, you do have deer out near the Bronx um, Botanical Gardens. As soon as you get a lot of forest, and there's a, mm-hmm. a native forest okay. out there that's been up since uh, 500 years ago. Uh, it's the it's near the Bronx River, and I'm sure they have deer there. I mean, we have deer right here in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. They've they've oh, really busy. gotten very bold in terms of their uh, range extension. Oh, they really have. In my front yard. They're very bold. The peri domestic, yeah, but you live in a kind of a rural area to begin with. Uh, although it never used to be that. I mean, it used to be more rural out there than it did. But here. There's a spillover. You might call it a spillover. We have these green corridors, like the Palisades Interstate Parkway, for instance, yeah. which goes all the way up to Harriman State Park, which is about a 40-mile corridor. And up there, of course, there's a lot of deer. And those deer just keep moving down. And, and people... You know, in, in in New Jersey, there's a big highway called Route 78. You, you're aware of that. Yep, 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 sure, sure. So near us, they have made deer crossings over Route 78. Exactly. So they don't try and cross on the road and get, I mean, if you hit them going 80 miles an hour, you you could get killed, right? You could get killed. So they make these deer crossings, which are all so they they trees growing them? on them, and the deer cross over that. It's very interesting. Anyway, there's seven hotspots for SARS-CoV-2 infection. They correspond to the areas with most deer, as you might expect. And one of them is pretty close to New York City. I remember us speculating the last time we reviewed this kind of literature, though, as to how the deer are catching this infection, right? Yeah, we still don't know. So what about these hotspots? Is there any hint that there are maybe people who have foster the, the, <laughs> the deer themselves? Like you, like you, for instance. Um, <clears throat> they I don't treat get them near as them, pets. though. They treat them <laughs> I don't as get pets. near them. Well, There's you don't no... have to get too near them. There's no Which hint in get... the paper as to how the deer. They do say, they, they all they say is, you know, we don't know how the deer get the virus from humans, but human activities such as feeding wildlife or targeted baiting of hunting prey <laughs> could yeah. provide the opportunity. So yeah. I guess you you put out bait and then the deer come and you hunt it, right? That's correct. But how does that, if you shoot the deer, it's dead. So I don't know how that works. That yeah, exactly well, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, some, of the, some shoot... of the bait snatchers are going to get away. Yeah, maybe the bait's contaminated with the virus yeah. from the human, right? I was curious as to whether or not their food or water might uh, be a source of it, too. But uh, apparently that's not true. Well, we just don't know. It's possible, I suppose, right? Because they do a lot but of Somehow snorting. it got in because it's quite clear that these are yeah. viruses from humans that, that get into the deer, right? Yeah. These deer, from bats to deer. <laughs> these deer don't snort at you when you go in your house. They don't, they used, no. in the beginning, they used to confront people like that. If there is a doe with a fawn, yeah. she will stomp her feet on the ground to, to tell the fawns to go away. Uh, so if you get near them, she stomps three times, once, twice, and the third time they run away. It's very interesting. Huh, so they can um, count. <laughs> I guess, and yeah, then they run away. But they don't snort or anything. And you know what's funny? I mean, in the backyard, they're often in the backyard, right? right? Right. In the summer when I'm out there, and so we we sometimes throw them bits of apple, right? There you go. You go on, yeah. Vincent. Go on. <laughs> and a deer the, the female Vincent the, is a deer, deer the female hugger. deer come. The female deer come, <laughs> and they eat it. And then the males come, and the females 
chase them away. They don't want them eating the, the, the apples. It's so funny. The, huh. and the males are just chicken. They just run away as soon as the, the female just turns to them and kind of threatens, and the males just run away. Right. They run away. Yet, it's funny. When they go to cross the road, all of the females go first, and then the male goes last. Is that right? That's right. Well, the males kind of wander around on their own. They, I mean, well, unless they they're in mating season, groups. they want to they, they want to follow the females. But most of the time, the males are just wandering around. They have their their racks, and they. Um, That's right. You can hear them walking through the woods because they hit the trees and they make clacking sounds. It's very interesting. And when they when they are uh, rutting, uh, they fight with each other. So that's one of the ways that the hunters get the deer to come to them. They have two antlers, and they rattle them, and it sounds like two fighting deer. Oh, there must be huh. something of value over here. So they come over and then they shoot them. They also can buy deer urine and use yeah, it. Yeah, that's also true. And in fact, the the guy in England I was talking to about chronic wasting disease. He said that hunters in Europe buy deer urine from other countries, and that's a possible way of transmitting <laughs> wasting uh, disease prions. Oh, yeah. my God. All right, anyway, back to deer. Yeah. Um, who's at risk? So males more more so than females, more, more positive males than females. They say they may be at higher risk uh, for SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the number of males... In season two, what was it? Markedly higher. I don't remember what it was. It was like was. twice as much, if you look at twice the graph. Twice as much. Yeah. It's almost uh, twice as many as a, as a portion of, uh, proportion of positive. Uh, a lot of this, twice as many males. A lot of this has to do with winter survival also. So I wonder what the winter was like in the first year versus the second year, whether more deer survived in the second year than in the first year. It's possible. Uh, then they do whole genome sequencing on 216 samples that were positive and with a CT value less than 30, make sure they have a good amount of RNA. And this is the interesting part. <laughs> you can find all these lineages, including three major variants of concern, alpha, gamma, and delta. And, <laughs> I mean, these are basically... Long after these are gone in humans. Uh, importantly, and this didn't really sink into me until later in the paper. Importantly, all of these viruses that they uh, pull out of the deer, even though they may be uh, alpha or delta or gamma like, have a significant number of mutations. So they aren't identical. Right. They've, they've, That's right. and we'll get into this in more detail, but they've undergone some evolution and probably some adaptation in the deer. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, the, so, well, and, and there are implications of that that we can talk about when we get down the road. So, um, they also found, you know, they find multiple variants, not just the variants of concern, uh, but as I said, alpha, gamma, and delta. And um, the alpha and delta were found in a couple of places. Uh, gamma, mostly a localized cluster in the southern tier, uh, but basically looks like... Uh, it's, these three are circulating at the same time in deer. Alpha, gamma, and delta are circulating in deer at the same time, which to me is really interesting because in humans, one displaces the other, yeah. right? And so there's no displacement in deer. That's really interesting. So <laughs> Did they all find multiple, multiple infections in the same deer? No. No, in the herd, you know, you can have some deer with alpha, some with gamma, some with delta. My, imp my impression, though, is, well, first of all, because they find these uh, not only clusters of infections, but clusters of uh, virus genotypes, that, and, they, and they come to the conclusion, because, partly because of this, that there are, these represent multiple spillover events. Right. So it could be that the communication amongst the deer statewide is not sufficient to really, you know, have the same sort of population inf level infection that uh, humans have so that you would see on a population level one variant be displaced by another. It would have to occur within one of these clusters, right? And, and maybe maybe it will. Maybe, the, maybe down the road, I don't know. Uh, so rich. You, if you follow a particular cluster, you'll see some evolution in subsequent years. You've raised a very interesting point, too, and that is that uh, what did the human 
epidemiology of the virus looked like in New York State as the deer populations were acquiring their infections because the amount of the, the number of new cases has gone way down, right? Because of the vaccinations and because of uh, pardon the pun, well, herd immunity. Disease <laughs> disease has gone down, but infections are still occurring, Dixon. Right? Yeah, so I know they're still, still occurring, but not at the same rate virus that they did. And infect the deer, even though you're vaccinated. So my my first of all, my uh, we'll get to some of the details of this, Dixon. But first of all, uh, my my knee jerk reaction to the fact that there were uh, more virus in season two in the 2021 season than the 2020 season is simply that because there was more uh, higher prevalence in the human population. Oh, okay. And so an increased chance that the deer would get it. They they don't say that. That was kind of my uh, my presumption. Okay. All but, right. Uh, and actually, hmm. they do track the virus or compare what's circulating in the humans with the deer. Good, good, and good, one of the good. things that they find, for example, I think most striking with alpha is that in the 2021 season, there's a lot of alpha circulating when it's gone from the humans and has been gone from the humans for six months. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so the deer and, and apparently all well, you put all this together, the deer are, transmitting it amongst themselves okay so they can serve as a reservoir for a variant of concern mm -hmm. for a period of time after it's gone from humans and that's one of the major bottom lines right. bottom from the paper although as you say they're different because they have now yeah. changed in the deer so we don't know if they could in fact Go back and that to me is the is humans. the huge question. Could you have right. spillback yeah. of any of these? And you, you know, they know. say in the discussion, there's and we did this paper. There's one suggestion in Canada that there was spillback from a deer to a human, right? Just one, and so we still don't know if that how happens that frequently. But I think what's interesting is that these variants all exist in deer, and that I mean that's. That's addressing the, the mechanism of displacement, right, in in populations. And, you know, I never really understand. I mean, I understand a new variant comes. It's more fit in some way, displaces the other. But I think that's a population effect. And, and I, maybe, as you say, the, there are not enough infected deer to see that effect. And maybe the alphas are separated from the gammas and the delta, so there's no competition, right? Yeah. And that's why it doesn't happen. And maybe if the... the infections increase, you, you would see it. So they do say we need to do routine surveillance to see what's going on. And I think that's a good idea in deer, right? Sample regularly and say, what's going on? Are these going to circulate forever like this? Or are they going to, one going to displace the other? Those are all interesting things. I Vincent, would, I would, are, I would kind of imagine that the, the, if the deer keep passing this around, that they will cook up variants that are quite deer specific. That's exactly they haven't what Vincent, been seeing you. Yeah, Vincent and I had this conversation before you came on, and I, I thought the exact same thing. It's, I mean, eventually you have a deer-specific strain of this virus. It may have no effect on humans whatsoever. But I'm curious as to whether you could actually li isolate the genome of the virus in the, in the droppings of the deer rather than having to sample a lymph node all the time. Why, why isn't it you in their feces? Probably, it should be. Probably, yeah, because you can get it in wastewater, right? Human exactly sewage. right, exactly right. So the, Because you know, the deer probably swallow their respiratory secretions, right? Absolutely. It passes through them. Yeah, I don't see why. So that's an interesting story. You could, do, you could make the surveillance easier and broader, right? Exactly right. <clears throat> so what are you going to do? Go, through, go around and look for deer poop, Dixon? No, it's easy. In the fall, it's very easy. All you have to do is find an apple orchard. Yeah. And the apples that fall on the ground, in fact, that's where you get a lot of these deer that are actually drunk. They actually get, uh, you know, because the fermentation reaction in the apple occurs. Seriously? And, yeah, I'm serious. And predators used to take advantage of that uh, when we had them. And, and they would, the deer uh, would get drunk because the apples are lying on the ground fermenting. That's right. The deer that's eat so them. funny. They get drunk. They, their, their level of awareness goes way down. Mm -hmm. And the predators can actually make an easy kill. Interesting. Including you know, us. Now that I think about it, we, there's, we always have deer poop on our lawn. It's very easy. It's 
simple yeah. to find. It, it, but unfortunately, yeah. it looks like rabbit poop. So they... <laughs> Pel- it's, it's, pellet- it's pellet-like, it's right? It's pelletized. Yeah, that's right. That's like goat. Like goat. They're, they're related to goats also. So, I mean, well, they're not related. I didn't mean to say that. Their, fec- <laughs> their, their way of forming a fecal pellet is the same. So they don't have a, a wet, moist uh, right. movement like uh, humans or maybe monkeys. But right. uh, What else do we have to tell you? <clears throat> they do some phylogenetic analysis, which show that, you know, they have these three clusters of uh, viruses, variants in deer, the gamma, delta, and alphas. They seem to be independent clusters. Um, what about relationship to human SARS-CoV-2? They say no direct links between the deer and humans were observed. In other words, you can't say this human sequence from New York is the right. one that went into these deer. They're too diverged from the human sequences. It's probably because they've been circulating a long time in the deer. Um, and this is interesting. This analysis, they, they look at the mutation rate. Um, the the uh, substitution rate in SARS-CoV-2 sequences in humans, 24 nucleotide substitutions for year. In deer, uh, 35, 36, and 26 for alpha, gamma, and delta. It's a little bit higher in, in some of the variants in deer, which it makes sense because it's newly introduced into deers, right? So it's going that through that initial diversification process. So my impression is that... Um, uh, it replicates well enough in deer so that it's not too difficult to establish yeah. uh, for it to spill over into the deer. But the divergence in sequence says that it's, uh, uh, not, it's not matched well enough so that um, the original sequence survives very well. It really needs to go through right. some adaptation. Right. And they... Yep. They do a lot of sequence analysis to they they note that some of the mutations that are found repeatedly in the deer variants are mutations that are infrequently seen in the human variants. And so the yeah. idea then is that these may represent uh, mutations that are adaptive to the deer. Right. Which is an interesting. You know, right. interesting idea. But I think their, to... their map of the state of New York and where they yeah. found it strongly suggests that there's an anthropogenic um, influence as to who catches this and who doesn't. And I can almost guarantee you that in the heavily human populated areas, there are many, 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 many people who actually set out food for the deer. Sure. Sure. And they've got their hands all over that stuff. And they're not being as sanitary as they are with their own food. No, and it's very, not. very it's possible not. that that's how it's transmitted. They, they look at, and as, as Rich said, there are a number of mutations in the individual genes. They focus on the spike gene and they find some, they're kind of, they're extremely rare. The similar changes are very rare in humans. So as Rich said, these are, these may be deer adaptive changes because they're more frequent in, in the deer. Right. But they'd have to test that if they really want to prove it. I don't know if anybody is going to do that. And then finally, they also look at a, they do an analysis called a geographic dispersal dynamics where they can, can we find where the virus first went into deer from humans and how it spread from there? Huh. Right. So they were able to do that for several, for example, Cuba, well, not Cuba, the country, but uh, I guess it's one of the counties uh, upstate, Dixon. Is it Cuba County? Mm, no, I don't it think a it's a county. I think it's a, t- a town. I think it's a town. Yeah, so they say Cuba was the first central focus <laughs> from which virus then went to other towns in the area. They could do. They could actually figure I mean, that out for some. They, they could actually now do some very interesting work of darting. Uh, deer with known strains of the virus and moving them to completely different herds to see whether or not that strain now gets established somewhere else without Are you saying really altering to do a the pattern. Challenge of the experiment in deers? Oh, yeah. Deer? Yeah, absolutely. 
I don't know if people would would be happy with that, with putting a virus out there in the deer. No, 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 no. The ones that are already infected, you don't give them the virus. You no, you, you dart, dart a deer, them. you take the sample, you find out what sample they've got, you keep them in captivity long enough, yeah. then you can move that deer somewhere else and see whether or not that strain now takes over. These, these deer are all dead. What? No, I know the that. The deer I, in this I, study are all dead. No, no, no. When I say dart, I don't mean shoot and kill. No, I understand what you're saying, but... That's a whole nother study. Of course. Right? I said now they can do that study. If they want to know oh, yeah. anything further about this, that's yeah. probably the yeah. direction that they should be going. Do you think that should be done, Dixon? I do. If you're interested in knowing what the answer is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so one of the things that occurred to me as yes. I was reading this is um, we still don't know where Omicron came from, right? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> and so there have been... Uh, so Omicron is characterized by uh, the, the apparent sudden emergence of a strain in humans that had lots of mutations in it. So mm -hmm. the, the, the question is, how do you all of a sudden come up with a virus uh, that has uh, so many differences in it? And there have been a number of different hypotheses to explain it. I, they come in like three different categories. I think one is that some immunocompromised individual may have been uh, cooking virus for a long period of time and it finally got out. Another is that there was, uh, because of the local environment, uh, sort of cryptic circulation of this for a yeah. long time. And another hypothesis that came up was maybe... SARS-CoV-2 got into an animal reservoir and went through some adaptation oh. in the animal reservoir and then spilled back into humans. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, I read that and I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and this yet, makes you wonder because yet, I mean, this is this is step one of that process, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Sure. You got it. All right. So, what are the conclusions here? Um, so we have um, spillover from humans, multiple spillovers from humans to deer in these two years, 20, 20, 21, followed by deer to deer transmission, circulation of these variants after the last detection in human in deer. Um, and they say further surveillance is needed to answer the question of whether variant displacement will happen in deer as it does in humans. So that's what we said before. Um, human activities should be investigated as a risk factor, like feeding deer. Maybe we shouldn't be feeding deer. <laughs> but I think it's kind of late. It's try already to there. Stop right? that. You just try to stop that. You know, and they'd rather kill them. No, they they have more affection for the deer than they do for the people, I'm afraid. A lot of the, people do. And then they least. talk about the changes they find in the deer isolates. The impact of such changes on the ability to transmit between deer or from deer to humans is unknown, should be investigated. Yep. Um, oh, by the way, in 2020, six and a half deer were harvested in the U.S. and Canada. Six and a half million. Six and a half million. That's a lot. Well, 30 million altogether, right? So that's yeah, a, that's, that's the population. A very, very high percentage. That's a high fraction. Yeah, very high yeah. fraction. And then probably it's all replaced by <laughs> instantly. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Nature of wars a vacuum. <laughs> they say that there's experimental infections of deer have shown a short window, five days of infectiousness, where really? they excrete virus and they can How interesting. infect another deer. So very short. I wonder if you could do, I mean, as I wonder if you could do cell culture studies to try and figure out or get some insight into the adaptation and the potential for spillback. Wow. I don't, I don't totally trust cell culture studies to do this kind of thing, but maybe you yeah. could get an idea. Are there any deer You'd cell lines? You'd have to use deer, deer cell deer cultures, Deer cells right? and human yeah, cells right. and ask yeah. whether these variants and check them against the original human strains as well grow better or worse on one cell type or another. It, but that, well, I agree that maybe it's not going to tell you, but it's a lot cheaper than doing deer, yeah. right? Well, plus you're not going to, uh, be able to uh, test for spillback by infecting humans, right? No. 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 Would you want to do a challenge study with these deer isolates in humans? 
Uh, no. <laughs> no, I don't think so no, either. I'm not I don't gonna, think uh, I'm not any, recommend any com- that. I don't think the IRB is going to go for it either. No, no. they won't. <laughs> <laughs> Their last sentence is these our observations highlight the need to establish continuous surveillance programs to monitor the circulation distribution and evolution of SARS-CoV-2 in wild, white-tailed deer populations and establish measures to minimize additional introductions that may lead to spillback to humans. So I just wonder how many other mammalian species out there here, here. are so extensively infected. I mean, deer are, are easy because they're hunted, right? Yeah, right. Well, we don't hunt mice. Right. What else do we hunt, Dixon, turkeys. besides deer? Wild turkeys? Yep. Crows. All sorts of birds. Ducks. All sorts of birds. Pheasants. Um, yep. And we trap. I mean, the, the ro- a lot of people The rodents are the things. most numerous, right? Yeah. What are? The rodents are the most numerous. So th- we should be looking extensively at rodents. We should be trapping them, right? So what, well, other, should... uh, what other animal species do we know get infected? I know cats. Geese. If Canada geese got infected, that would uh, just about seal it for <laughs> very domestic life as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Dixon? Because they're are everywhere, are everywhere. Basically, they are right. everywhere. They do not migrate any longer. They are very happy where they are. Okay. So they don't have to are... be fed. They eat grass. That's what they eat. They eat grass. Well, this is a list of animals infected in in zoos. That's not what I want. No, 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 no. <laughs> I but want we, to know we hunt animals. a lot of different things. We have a bear season. Um, we we used to have a you know a top carnivore season, like for mountain lions and twenty nine types of animals. But in the country, well, we, from last we do May. a lot of hunting. That's right okay. I'm 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 sitting here on the edge of my chair in suspense. What are these animals? <laughs> All right, here we go. Cats. <laughs> Cats, dogs, ferrets, gorillas, hamsters, hippos, hyenas, mice, otters, pigs, rabbits, tigers. My goodness. Wow. Those are some of them. Deer, of course. This sounds like a West Nile virus. <laughs> it's just, it has, except there's no insect. Uh, oh, they make the statement in the paper about the virus being a generalist. Do you remember yeah. that yeah. they say it doesn't, it doesn't seem to require any Promiscuous. I have heard that term used. What What is the statement? Let's, let me get a generalist. Here, the absence of or very low frequency of fixed mutation in the S gene in deer isolates suggests that host specific adaptation was not necessary for human to deer spillover, reinforcing the notion of SARS CoV 2 as a generalist. In other words, among all the deer isolates, you don't see any one change in, in spike that is in all of them. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, that important point. It's not like it's not like something had to happen in humans to create a virus that could then spill over into deer. Right. The human yeah, virus can infect the deer and then undergo some but, more ad- adaptation. Mitch, it's possible that this is not a human virus. This has, is a wildlife virus that uh, spread into humans in China someplace. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's so the that idea. The origin that was the origin of it. So, yep. and the same for SARS-CoV-1. So. Um, kind of makes you wonder. We're all related. Yeah, <laughs> everything is connected. There's no way to avoid it. <laughs> and we we foster connections that nature wouldn't dream of making, like having a zoo, for instance, or uh, feeding apples to the deer. feeding apples to otherwise predated food sources for predators. Uh, we we just. We take pity on them and uh, don't realize right. what's going on in nature. That's all. Let's do one round of email. Kadok. Rich, can you take the first one? I'd love to. Hibiscus writes. That's uh, me, Rich. right? Yeah, Rich. Hibiscus writes. Hello, Vincent and company. I am a microbiology student from Southern California and have been listening to TWIV and TWIM for quite a number of years now. The weather has been drying up since that much needed rainstorm uh almost time for electric blankets to be put away with temperatures varying between 71 uh and 42 fahrenheit 20 to 6 c i apologize ahead of time if this email is extremely long Uh, it's you know longish but we've had much longer 
That's right. I have finally taken my first microbiology class, and I love every bit of it. Happy to say I am looking forward to my medical bacteriology class even more than ever. My school does not have a lab equipped with the proper equipment required for a virology lab, so I'm on the fence about taking virology when it will only be a lecture course. Well, let's push you right off that fence. Go for it. Okay, <laughs> you can uh, you can do this fine without a laboratory. Uh, the viruses are cool. Go for it. My family and I recently had an incident <laughs> with what I believe was norovirus. For those out there, that's the cruise ship slash two bucket disease. Yep. Uh, a gastro it causes a gastroenteritis, and I was wondering if there were any preventative measures we could take until a vaccine is finally available. I, uh, I know a five-year trial was recently c concluded and have been checking on it every so often. Would not suggest norovirus to anyone. It's not she, fun. She is Sorry. Right. Uh, you're out of Wash luck. Your hands. Wash, Wash your, your hands. hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands and don't have kids. Right? <laughs> 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 or if you have kids, keep them <laughs> locked up in their rooms. Okay, because the minute your kids get out and mix it up with other kids, they're going to bring it home. And once a year or so, you're going to go through this where you're lying on the living room floor, camped out all night with your kids <laughs> near the bathroom. Okay? Been there, done that. It's a rite of passage. I know it's been a while since the episode was released, but I disagree with the alternative options presented in the nuclear physics discussion <laughs> in TWIV episode 958. <clears throat> I believe that hydrogen peroxide, sugar, and some kind of catalyst will be the best fuel source uh, because the resulting waste will be water. My dad's friend came up with an engine for this to uh, for this fuel in cars and gives a uh, link to a YouTube video. Sadly, he died. However, his uh, patent is still kicking around on the internet. My dad, on the other hand, believes that the best alternative is wave generators because not only uh, will the waves be uh, in, uh, indefinite, but there could also be a positive ecological impact due to the availability of areas where uh, sedentary marine life can settle. Unfortunately, the additive in paint on large boats has all but eradicated free-swimming embryonic marine life. There are many excellent textbooks on alternate and alternative energy that can explain the production process better than I can. And understanding that process is extremely important when choosing which is best. I so dearly wish public transportation could be more efficient. Then we wouldn't have to worry about uh, such things as much. Well, there's a wrap <laughs> and no doubt about it. Okay, go for it. Uh, we do need alternative uh, energy and transportation sources. I just, uh, you know, I do contribute, but, you know, there's just too many damn cars and too many gasoline cars and not enough trains and not enough subways in this country. Anyway. And none of them were on time. Yeah. <laughs> also, I agree we should always close the lid before flushing. Absolutely. Furthermore, all those hand-drying blower thingies should be removed because I'm pretty sure they spread it just as much as fecal matter. Bring back the paper towels, please. Here, here. And if you look back far enough on Twiv, you can find episodes talking about how the uh, blowing hand dryers spray microbes around. My parents and I have been very thankful for Twiv during a pandemic. The clinical updates have been very helpful. I was also fascinated by the prion disease discussion. I did not know that a prion protein was a specific type of protein. Thank you for reading. Hibiscus. P.S. Please reprimand my dad. He keeps thinking <laughs> Vincent's last name is Dragon Yellow. <laughs> okay. Okay, Dad. Get it together. It's Dragon Yellow. Dixon, um, did you hear that the New Jersey governor wants us all to drive electric cars by 2035? I did 2035? hear that. I did hear that. He moved it back from 2050. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. very optimistic. And uh, I think with the right incentives, it's going to happen, basically. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Cynthia writes. No, that's not right. What do you mean that's not it's right? It's one before. 
I don't recall who sent this in, right? Oh, no, no that's not an author. <laughs> right, I'll read it anyway. you can do. Okay, here we go. Here's the person who wrote this in. I don't recall who sent this in, writes. A basic observation of immunology is that the second exposure of an antigen produces a more rapid and robust immunologic response. This left me wondering why we only get one injection of the seasonal influenza vaccine each year, even in years when we have a major antigenic shift like the 2009 H1N1 strain. Wouldn't we get a more robust response and better protection from illness and severe disease with a two-dose regimen? Well then, Vincent, you asked Florian Kramer, and here is Florian Kramer's response. Good and valid question. I think in some cases this may be a good idea. The general assumption is that one shot is enough to bring titers up if people have seen related virus, related strains, but we know from vaccination with pandemic vaccines, for instance H5N1, that two shots are needed to induce good immunity if the person hasn't seen this virus subtype before. The same is true in small children with seasonal vaccines. They get two shots of the regular flu vaccine at reduced dose because only of if. They, because only if they see the virus twice, they make a good response. In a way, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, and we'll just pause a moment while this medic goes by, in a way... <clears throat> In a way, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic virus was an exception. Initially, two shots were planned, but one shot did the job. The reason for this is likely that older people had seen the viruses with a related HA already, and there is also some epitope similarity with some of the H1N1 viruses circulating in the 1980s. But yes, it may be a good idea to do a trial and see if that works better, especially if a significant drift occurs. Best for you. And who is a recognized expert on influence virus. He is. So, great question. Yes. Great answer. Question. I Absolutely. learned something. Hey, so did I. Cynthia writes, Dear Twivers, I just had a great interview with game developer and TB survivor I thought you would all enjoy, especially Alan. So Cynthia gives a link. <laughs> You're Sick and It's Your Fault by David Moskowitz. A solo journaling game, Wretched and Alone Hack, Exploring the Stigma of Illness. Okay, it's a game. Alan would like that. Thanks for so much of your... Thank you so much for all your amazing work. And I will read one more. Donna writes, I watch this a lot and have learned a great deal. I am a 64-year-old with primary immunodeficiency and lupus. One of the things that bothers me is the use of tech speak, as I was not trained in virology, and so terms like antivirus are unfamiliar to me. And when asked to talk about it, there is sort of an impatience with the idea that anyone who doesn't know is unworthy of being in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I was trained in diagnostic medical psychology, so I know how easy it is to fall into this habit, especially when it is how one speaks to others also trained thus but I feel it is also important to be able to break things down for those not trained thus. I guess it is much like having to become bilingual. Smile. <laughs> I just wanted to try and get this feedback to you as I have followed you since the pandemic and oh, found all the this weekend and joined and have enjoyed them greatly. Thank you, Donna. Great. Well, yeah, Donna, Donna sometimes... thanks for the reminder. You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're right. We, we sometimes do say <laughs> these things and don't do. explain them. I'm sorry. We do our best, and um, if we don't, just write and ask us. I try to be the guardian of that kind of thing because yeah. I, I am not as familiar as these two other august gentlemen are with regards to the virological terms. Uh, but um, in my own field, in parasitology, you get it all the time. You start slinging out these Latin names, and everybody just turns off. So you have to simplify it. Hmm. Without dumbing it down. Simplify without dumbing it down. It's hard to do, by the way. It Vin is hard. Vincent, is that a cow over your left shoulder? On the shelf there? <laughs> it is. No, it's a ferret. My left shoulder. That's this. Yeah. Where is the... That where, black and white thing black with, and a, white with ferret? a bandana. Oh, this is a ferret. It's a ferret. Oh, It's okay. a ferret. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Where'd you get the ferret? Uh, so at ASV last year, last summer, were you at ASV? Yeah. I, and I didn't people, get a ferret. 
No, I don't know why. There's a few people in the front row from this company, IITRI, which is a um, contract research organization. You know, they do stuff for other companies. Uh -huh. And uh, they gave me this ferret because yeah. I guess they do ferret experiments. Isn't it cute? Yeah, that's cool. Did you, did you tell them that cute. ferrets are not people? Ferrets are not people, and you can see it right now. <laughs> They're not even cows. <laughs> Look what else I have here on my show. Whoa. Spinner spinner flask. flask. That's awesome. A little one. I threw out so many of these. Uh, I think I've shown you this before, but I'm going to show you what I got. Oh, you, you guys. You guys. <laughs> are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, blacks. Very good. Those are beautiful. They're gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah, that's why you work on Vaxiniavirus. It makes nice plaques. It's very nice. Um, one more thing. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> now that we're doing show and tell. Cut it out! <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, I got another one while he's digging around. <laughs> They're going to love this, Dixon. Look at this. Whoa! <laughs> well, you showed it to me box. the last time I was in, uh, a in the box. I yeah, brought a this gel box when I cleaned out my office a couple of weeks ago. This was in yeah. it, so I took it. This is a box we used to use to run gels. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? It's beautiful. It's got the Columbia University property sticker. That's right. So you Screw you. I took it. <laughs> Check I this wish. out. What do you got? Ooh, an ampule of that vaccinia. That is an ampule. No, that's uh, a, <laughs> this is uh, from some from somewhere in Russia. It's uh, an intestinal bacteriophage. This is supposed to have therapeutic cool. value. Okay. That's nice. I don't know exactly what it is. Does there's it Russian, Russian, there's Russian it? writing on it, yeah, which of course I can't read. Cerulean. That may no. that may um, uh, elaborate some. Donna Duckworth gave me that. Very cool. Can you take a picture of it? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, I can get it translated for you. Okay. I've got a bifurcated needle here too, but I'll save that for another time. A bifurcated needle. <laughs> time for some pick sticks, and you're up first. Okay, well, uh, we're still trudging our way through the uh, uh, the likes and dislikes of me with regards to the uh, the developers of jazz and the people that are still practicing it. And uh, today, it's really uh, one that everybody's totally familiar with is for the, the first one, the, the vibraphone. Uh, the, uh, the vibraphone is a wonderful jazz instrument. And Lionel Hampton uh, was looked at as the, I don't know, the, the, I was going to say the father of modern, no, but he's not. He, he actually captured all of the music that uh, jazz vibraphone was mm. became known for and played them regularly at various concerts, etc. Gary Burton and Cal Jader are the modern equivalents of, La of Lionel Hampton, who took the instrument to another level. You can see these people playing with four mallets. How the heck do you keep track of four mallets all at the <laughs> same time? I can't even do two. I, one is fine for me, but, uh, you know, they have a gift that just goes way beyond. It's a percussion instrument, so like drummers, piano players, yeah. and uh, vibra vibraponists, or however, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, are lumped into this category. But Lionel Hampton, for my money, has... He's got it all over all of these other guys because of his enthusiasm. I had the privilege of seeing Lionel Hampton's almost last concert, uh, and he played this signature song that I've listed here, Flying Home. Everybody knows this song. I, I, I won't play it for you by just singing it, but it's a song which absolutely, if you hear that song, you think of Lionel Hampton, nobody else. He popularized it. He made it his signature. It was like his uh, emblem and his anthem. Uh, a wonderful song and a wonderful performer with major enthusiasm. <clears throat> One of the tragedies in his life was that later on in his life, uh, there was a fire. He lived in New York City, and a fire consumed all, I mean, mm. all of his treasures. He didn't have any spinner flasks to show off. He didn't have any vials of virus fighters or he had nothing. He had none of his awards. He had none of his sheet music. He had none of his records or CDs or whatever else he was collecting. And you should have seen his response to that. He says, you know what? I lived all of that, and I can still remember it. And as long as I can remember it, it's still with me. So I don't mm -hmm. miss the, the actual material. I, I'm still compass mentis enough to know uh, all of the good times that I've ever had.
So he has a wonderful attitude about it also. Cool. His, uh, his progenitor is Gary Burton, or the inheritors, I should say, of his instrument, uh, Gary Burton. <clears throat> uh, I did leave out one major uh, vibraphonist, which I'm sure I'm going to get email about, and I'm blocking on the man's name, but he was the uh, man who played this instrument in the Modern Jazz Quartet, and if I could remember his name right now, I would give it to you. I'll bet you that Rich could look that up as I'm speaking. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, Gary Burton, fantastic instrument, does a lot of collaborations with other jazz uh, personalities also, including uh, my big pick of the week last week, which was for uh, Pat Metheny on guitar. Um, <laughs> he has unusual titles for not only his albums, but also the songs that go with them. Uh, these titles have nothing to do with the sound of the music itself, so I don't even know what they mean, except that uh, they're sort of abstract jazz, abstract thinking, abstract words. And then finally, Cal Jader. Cal Jader is like mainstream Latin music. He's wonderful, and you'll just love this song, Wachuara, which is... Um, one of the theme songs for Dizzy Gillespie as well. Uh, Vincent, you after the show, you should play this. It, it's just wonderful to listen to, and it's, it's a great, great sound. It's not intrusive. It's relaxing. Uh, Lewis, the guy's name was Lewis, I believe, the, the guy who played. No, 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 that's not right. He was uh, the piano player. I'm still trying to think of... Uh, Oh, the, I, I, I'm sorry. It's, it's just not coming to me right now. I played um, the vibraphone for the Modern Jazz Quartet, but it, it was a gentle song, and I'll add his name to this list when uh, I get a chance to look it up right after we finish this podcast. Dixon, what's the... Uh, Milt Jackson? Milt Jackson. That's the guy. So okay. we'll, we'll put his name right in there. Uh, so there are four major giants in the world of jazz who not just popularized the instrument, but played it with such finesse and such tenderness and such um, skill that um, the songs themselves just melt in the background. And by the way, um, the song that I picked for the Modern Jazz Quartet uh, called Ice Skating in Central Park, the um, lead song uh, is by Milt Jackson for the the quartet, and it's a wonderful, beautiful, melodic. Uh, you wouldn't even think it was jazz. I mean, you would think it's like mm. it's something that comes out of the imagination of very gifted people. Basically, that's what jazz is, and um, just fantastic. Just I, I just that's why I love it because. Uh, as I mentioned before, when one of these people comes into concert, and I've, I've seen Dave Brubeck many, many, many times, he plays the same songs each time, but every time he plays them, they're, they're always different. And that's the beauty of it. It's like viruses. You can have a strain of virus that's the same when you start, but every time you look, it's changed, and it becomes something a little bit different. And maybe that's part of the attraction that we had for, have for science, the same is true for this music. Uh, remember, half of the music that's being played is not written. Yeah, It's all ad lib. I mean, it's just quite amazing how wonderful the human spirit and um, intellect is to put those two things together into music that resonates with your... Uh, Oh, I don't know. I'm I'm waxing too philosophical here. <laughs> so what's, what's the difference between a vibraphone and a xylophone? Uh, well, a xylophone is what they play in the marching bands. <laughs> okay, it's metal. I think it's metal versus wood, right? Uh, no, those are. That's a different instrument. That's a totally different instrument, and it, that's got another name. And I'm blocking on that name as well now. But it right. has a no totally word. different sound, also. Marimba, Thank you, a marimba, a marimba. I think it's called marimba. marimba. Thank you, Dixon. Hey, Rich, what do you have for us? I got a book. It's called The American Phage Group, Founders of Molecular Biology by wow. our acquaintance, William C. Summers. Huh. <clears throat> so, a uh, little bit of background. Uh, Bill Summers was one of my mentors. He um, taught me most of uh, what I knew about uh, phage T7 
how to grow it, et cetera. He was uh, Ed Nile's postdoc mentor. That's how Ed and I got together. Um, and uh, uh, Bill uh, ultimately morphed into a science historian. Uh, and I think it's still, I don't think he's even emeritus yet at Yale, has taught science history for uh, some time. Uh, and, you know, obviously has a phage background. And so wrote this book about the uh, evolution and impact of what's called the American phage group. Now, he starts out by recant, uh, re, uh, uh, recalling uh, sort of the mythos of the American phage group, which is that there were these uh, renegade physicists, uh, notably uh, Max Delbrook uh, and Salvador Luria, and uh, ultimately Al, Al Hershey being the uh, triumvirate that established the American phage group, uh, who decided that they were going to solve all the basic questions of life and genes by studying bacteriophage and also launched uh, uh, basically summer courses at Cold Spring Harbor and meetings at Cold Spring Harbor so that that became uh, sort of a, a focal center, a center of this. And really... Uh, as described by Bill in this book, uh, Max Delbrook in particular, really uh, managed this as if he were de quite deliberately creating a new discipline and, and mm. making it and making it happen. Uh, and it is uh, certainly true, uh, in my mind at least, that much of the origins of molecular biology uh, uh, derive uh, from, from this group. Um, uh, the, the mythos is recorded... Uh, famously in um, Phage and the Origins of Molecular Biology, which is what uh, Bill describes as a Festschrift, that is a, mm -hmm. um, a volume that celebrates something. In particular, in this case, I think it was Max Delbrook's 60th birthday. And it contains contributions from a bunch of different people from the American Phage Group uh, and sort of reminiscing either you know, it's very higgledy piggledy, either reminiscing about uh, their experiences in the phage group or actually presenting some science and stuff. Uh, but uh, Bill's uh, thesis is that uh, the uh, evolution of the phage group and its impact goes way, way beyond that mythos. And he uh, starts uh, much further back uh, and traces the mm. uh, histories of some of the people involved and some of the people who did not become involved uh, and talks uh, more broadly about uh, other peripheral groups and, and how it spread out. So it's a very, very well-researched and very complete history uh, of the development of a discipline that had a profound impact on on science in general because molecular biology is kind of uh, a lot about where we're at nowadays so good read i recommend it bill was on twiv 573 november 2019 just before the the thing hit the fan right i was still when we were doing audio only <laughs> and he gave a nice um lynette lecture at asv i think yes. before we had him on right yeah, that's what got me interested in uh, in having him on. That Lynette lecture was very good. All right, my my pick. So last week I picked the DJ um, Chris Luno, and and last Friday <clears throat> after Twiv Dixon and I sat here drinking scotch and listening to him, and one of the songs he played it was marvelous. Had, it was marvelous. Had a riff of Take Five. That's right. I just was set to electronic music. It was just great. Anyway, yeah. so I have been listening here in the incubator, and I discovered another DJ <laughs> on YouTube. So I wanted to share. Her name is, is – her, her professional name is Miss Monique. Her real name is Olicia Arkusha, and she's from Ukraine. Mm. Uh, she is a DJ, and her, her kind of music style is called Progressive House. And – I really like her her compositions. You know, a DJ puts pieces together and embellishes them, and I, th I think it's really creative. My son is an amateur DJ, and he's turned me on to Chris Luno, and I, I found Miss Monique on her own. I really like it, and he agrees that she's very good, very popular. But part of the appeal here is just understanding all the different genres and subgenres of electronic music. So 
what is progress? So progressive was a, was a word used in rock music years ago, right? Pro we talked about progressive rock, something that was slightly different from the other rock that was going on. And that word has been used for electronic music. House music is a kind of music. Here's the definition. Characterized by a repetitive four on the floor beat and a typical tempo of 120 beats per minute. That's house. And it's all, you know, you can dance to it and stuff. And then progressive house is something a little different. Okay. I, I find the definitions really interesting. And, but her music is great. And I love listening to it. It is, as Dixon would say, it's repetitive. No, but, but it's hypnotic. It's also hypnotic. It's, it's hypnotic. There's a lot of. And it's not distracting at all if you want to have it in the background and chill. I really like it. It's also good for dancing. I love it very much. And her stuff is really good. So check Miss Monique. And we also have a listener pick from Megan who writes, Hi, Twiv crew. Thanks, as always, for your fantastic video podcast. While not traditionally a jazz listener, I have been enjoying Dixon's pick and learning more about the history and love anecdotes. If no one has shared this with you yet, I recommend the following podcast episode from one year, The Day the Music Stopped, How a 1942 Recording Band Changed America Forever. It was fascinating to hear a bit more about the historical context that gave rise to many of the names adorning Dixon's list. I hope you enjoy it. And she provides I'll a link. That yeah. <clears throat> uh, then, uh, as, as a silly, funny thing, a second pick, my favorite jazz quote album, The Weather Channel <laughs> presents the best of smooth jazz. <laughs> That's good. I like it. <laughs> this, was the, this was the music that was played during the locals on the eights on the Weather Channel. I remember being so disappointed when they swapped to using regular pop music. I lost yeah. my one spot of jazz exposure at that time. That's, I like it. <laughs> you know about that, Dixon? I do, of course. of course. Keep on making that infectious podcast, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Or Megan. It's, it was, it's it. now elevator music, Megan. If you want it, you can still have it, but you have to take an elevator. <laughs> that is Preferably Twiv. one up to the hundredth floor of a building. <laughs> That's Twiv 985, 15 left to 1,000. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twiv. You can send us your questions, your comments, or your picks to Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. We'd love your support microbe.tv slash contribute dixon de pommiers at trichinella.org the living river.org thank you dixon you're welcome vincent this was um great great absolutely and, and, great and next week um uh let's see do we have a guest next week oh yeah we have a guest so you know you could you could sneak in if you wanted to <laughs> i wouldn't object. I, I'll, I'll just shut up and listen i'll be the fly on the wall <laughs> no, you can come because then we can have a drink afterwards it's fine Maybe we'll go have something to eat. <laughs> Maybe we'll go out and have something to eat. That would be Rich good. Condit, Meredith Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Jolene for the timestamps, and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.